Now, Tom Caron is a man who loves what he does. He's a designer and used to run Ogle Design, a design compound where whatever came into the minds of those who worked there or was commissioned by a client could be built into a prototype and sent out into the world. For instance, if you had a chopper bike, then you must in part thank Ogle for their original work on the design. Caron's concept art was then taken up by Alan Oakley, head of the design team at Rally Bikes. They were heady days, the late 1960s and early 70s. They were a time when British design met manufacturing capabilities and produce products that the world came to envy and want. And from the Ogle compound came crash test dummies, the three-wheeled Bond bug car and, our theme of the week, the Popemobile. And that is where we started our conversation with Tom. There were, in fact, two Popemobiles. One was based on a Range Rover, which he rode in among small crowds, and one was based on a truck, which was much taller when there were, sort of, I know, millions milling around. We designed the t two vehicles, and uh, the interesting bit was um, the police would have liked him to be in a tank, and the church would have liked him to be seen sort of waving his arms around. And so we sort of compromised as to where the bulletproof glass would be. And uh, I think we set a new standard for Pope mobiles, and I think since then they've been modeled a bit on ours, but I don't think quite as nice. Mm. Um, tell me about some of the other things that Ogle Design um, came up with, the crash test dummies as well. Well, that was lovely, yes. I was so lucky to tumble across that. What happened, I found that uh, Ford and General Motors were using different kind of dummies. And I knew that they would never use one another's dummies. And therefore it seemed obvious that some neutral body, if they made a dummy, both might be able to use it. So we got into the act and started developing uh, dummies for a variety of purposes. They were lovely products and they were very sophisticated animals. The sort of bone structure and the, 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 the muscle structure and the skin were all reproduced. We made some lovely child dummies. They were gorgeous, you know, and one of them, a baby dummy I took home and my, my girl sort of cradled it, you know, and, and made a big fuss and put it in a cot because babies have heavy heads and it had all of that kind of feel to it. They were lovely yeah. and, uh, it was a profitable line as well, which sometimes helped when other things didn't go so well. Yeah. Um, and what about the chopper bike? Where did those handlebars um, on the chopper come from? Uh, what happened was that um, the West Coast to America starts quite a few trends. And one of them was a bicycle made by Schwint. It had sort of high handlebars. It was a tough kind of bike because kids would sort of throw it on the pavement and go into a truck store and get their coke or whatever and then pick it up upright you know and then jump on it and ride away i suppose it may have had con connotation with motorbikes as well the saddle had a sort of back with a nice strap in, down, down the middle and then it had these big tubes behind and then of course the the gear shift was a fantastic feature. So it was actually a lever, wasn't the, well, it? Well, yes, there was a sort of like a gearbox, you know, and, and there's a great big lever, and, and uh, that had a fantastic appeal to it. How much did it retail for, do you know? I can't remember, but I, I, I have a feeling it may have been something like £37, which was very expensive mm -hmm. then. I mm. mean, 40 years ago. That was a lot of money. Which is why not everybody could have one. That's right, that's <laughs> yeah. right. Um, tell me a bit about the Bond bug thing. It's obviously something that you very much still carry with you. Yeah. I had a bee in my bonnet that, A, I, I, I quite like three-wheelers. I'm, I'm not prejudiced against them because uh, there's a sort of elegance about the simplicity. You throw away a wheel and a suspension. And you have a simpler frame because on a three-wheeler you don't have twist on the chassis, so that's quite elegant. And when I came to start working for Reliant, which was in about, well, it was 1963, I started talking about the two-seat sporty three-wheeler. And we even made some little eight-scale models that were quite cute. And they said, no, 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 forget it, you know, not for us. And then at some point they, they bought a Bond, another company, and... Um, they suddenly needed to put a product into Bond. And uh, they said, OK, go ahead, designers said two-seat, sporty three-wheeler. And so 
at last, success, we could do this. And can you describe the Bond bug to us? I mean, for people who right. you know, never saw it. It had two wheels at the back and one wheel at the front. It, uh, it was broadly wedge-shaped. One of the nice features in, in terms of the simplicity was that the whole canopy and, and, and windscreen and roof actually opened up forward so that you could sort of get up and step out or step into it, which was quite fun. But it meant that um, you only had one door, which meant one set of hinges and one lock and one fitting time. So again, it's part of the elegance of it. And then at some point I said, uh, you need to paint them all the same color. And uh, very, very, very sensibly, they, we agreed on orange. I think because of um, some pigments co costing more than others, I think it was the cheapest orange going, but it, it worked. And, I don't um, know whether I'd know the difference between a cheap uh, orange and an expensive uh, orange anyway. But, but did you design them to, to just be, you know, fun cars or... or you know, was there a more serious element to them? You actually, you were thinking, as designers are thinking now, about the smaller engine and, you know, the use in towns and all that kind of stuff. I saw this as a sort of sporty thing that uh, young people could drive at 16, incidentally, that was inexpensive to run. It was easy to service. And um, I, I think if, if it had a fair wind or the stars had been in the right quarter, it could have been fairly, fairly successful. It, it was launched in 1970 when uh, ev every, every factory was on strike or, or, you know, and management spent their time discussing wages and conditions yeah, yeah, and things and, weeks, and yeah. they weren't manufacturing anything. So they had far too few uh, 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 vehicles at launch time and they could have had many more and sold them all. Is it the thing that you're most proud of designing though? No, it was the most fun project of all and I love the enthusiasm of the people who, who are bug owners and there are bug owners despite the fact that it was only sold in this country and only, I know, 2,600 were made, something like that. There are bug owners in 17 countries in the world on four continents, you know, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, you name it, there are, there are bug owners. Mm. And that, that is a fantastic success for a funny little car with a very simple chassis, three wheels, a very ordinary engine, basically. Yeah. You are still designing now, um, and you've recently had something in the, the summer exhibition as well, haven't you? What's, oh, yes. <laughs> what's that? That's less of a design and more of an observation, isn't it? <laughs> well... I think I think to design design is observation. You you have to look around and see what's good and what isn't, and how can you make things better. And um, I couldn't help noticing that uh, women have to queue at ladies in public places, you know. And I th I think that's miserable. And the fact that the architects haven't woken up to that and it's a, it's astonishing. You know, yes, and, and I find that. Um, they have the same problem in the States, they have the same problem in France, and I dare say all around Europe. And I just can't understand it. So anyway, at some point I had the idea of, of, of having with the same kind of um, design that you get on, on, on toilets, having a queue of ladies, one of them with a, with a little girl queuing at the, at the door of the ladies. And so I made this very simple, you know, sort of a silhouette design of it. Then I submitted it to the summer exhibition, and to my great delight, it got in. It um, resonated with people in a big way, mm. in, and not only women, incidentally. So that that was that was very satisfying mm. in a way. But Tom, what's the design solution to the problem? Architects just should wake up to the fact that women need, uh, you know, bigger loose space and. Uh, and bigger cubicles, sometimes they take in the, the, a child in there, you know. I mean, I call my sculpture ladies in waiting because that's what they do. But uh, I suppose another name could have been uh, inequality before the loo. 